Somebody turn the microphone up. How's everybody doing? So some of you have noticed that the video from last time has not been posted. It won't be. Oh man, yeah. The chip that we store these on, that I that I record these on went bad. Technical problems happen sometimes. It's a good reason it's, it's a good reason to come to class. Right? I will post an edited form of a previous video that will have most of what I had to say, but it probably won't contain everything I had to say. So that's why it's obviously good to come to class. I don't do those on purpose. It, the, the chip literally went bad, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. And believe me, nobody was unhappier than I was because I like having complete copies of my lectures. But there's no way of reviving the chip. It died. Yeah. Somebody's laughing. I'm not laughing, but anyway. All right. So uh, as I said, I will post an edited version of that from a previous uh, lecture, and it'll have most of what I talked about. But there may be some things I talked about that I did that won't make it onto uh, that lecture. My highlights are always a good idea to look at for what I talked about. OK. Um, we are moving along well now through the uh, protein structure. Today I'm going to talk about tertiary structure, quaternary structure, and then some considerations about uh, protein structure that are sort of external to the basic types of structure. Okay? So the first of these I want to talk about, last time I, I finished talking about fibrous proteins. And fibrous proteins, I told you, had a repeating secondary structure. And that was really all they had. They didn't really have much in the way of bends or anything like that. And so from that, you can surmise that bends give rise to the next type of, of uh, protein structure that we talk about. And that's tertiary structure. So if you look back at your notes where I defined tertiary structure originally, I said that tertiary structure arose as a result of interactions between amino acids that are not close in primary sequence, meaning that they are more than 10 amino acids apart in the overall structure. Okay? This group of proteins that has tertiary structure is a group of proteins we call globular. And the vast majority of proteins on the face of the earth are globular in nature. When we talk about, excuse me, we talk about the process of folding, we're talking about those bends and so forth that are happening to give that overall protein structure. Here's a really good example. Okay? This is a protein that we'll talk more about next week called myoglobin. And myoglobin is a protein that stores oxygen in your muscles. Okay? You see it shown in two different forms on the screen, and there's a reason for that. The one on the left is what we call a ribbon structure. Get my pointer out of my pocket here. What did I do with it? There we go. Okay. The one on the left is what we call a ribbon structure. And this ribbon structure, there we go. All right is drawn so that you can see, look, there's alpha helix, there's alpha helix. This guy is mostly alpha helix with a bunch of bends. Okay? And in the middle of this protein, there's a, 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 a non-amino acid. It's called a prosthetic group. We'll talk about that later. But this prosthetic group is called heme. And it's the same prosthetic group you find in hemoglobin, which is what gives hemoglobin its name. And it's this group that binds to the oxygen. Now, you see a big difference between the structure on the left and the structure on the right. So I want to talk about that difference before I talk about the tertiary nature of this. They're the same protein. The same protein. Okay? The one on the right shows essentially all the atoms, even there's some atoms missing in the one on the right. But it gives you more of a feeling for what that sucker actually looks like. All right? And you look at this, and you have a hard time seeing those secondary structures like alpha helix and so forth. They're there, but it's so confusing that your eyes don't pick that out. Okay? So this space filling model that we see on the right really doesn't tell us much about secondary structure. So we use ribbon diagrams to schematically show people where the secondary structures are and what it would look like if we didn't have all those other atoms that were there confusing our eyes. Ribbon diagrams are very commonly used to show protein structures. Okay? 
But this is a reminder on the right of what the thing actually looks like. Now, question? OK. If we look at the uh, structure of this, whether it's the left or the right, and probably the one on the left is the easier of the two uh, to understand, we see sort of like what I described the other day. That is that we have an end, and we have another end. A protein will always have two ends. And this end starts, and it makes an alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix. And then we have a bend, and you can see the bend sort of down here at the bottom. And that bend turns into something else that becomes another alpha helix, then a bend, and then another alpha helix, et cetera, et cetera. The overall three-dimensional structure of this protein arises because of those bends. So those bends are pretty critical then in determining what the overall structure that this protein has. If we look at, let's say, these two helices that are right here, the one on the left right there and the one on the right, we could imagine that some of the atoms from this helix on the left, let's say maybe a carbonyl group, might be hydrogen bonded to an amine on the helix on the right. OK? That's not difficult to imagine. This is a fundamentally different kind of interaction than we saw in secondary structure. In secondary structure, we would see interactions between this part of the helix and this part of the helix. So this part of the helix and this part of the helix. These amino acids would be within 10 of each other. But if I were to have interactions between this part of the helix here and this part of the helix on this other helix on the right, those amino acids are going to be more than 10 apart. But they're still going to be stabilizing the overall structure. So interactions greater than 10 amino acids apart are part of tertiary structure. So these interactions between these parts of these two helices are giving rise to tertiary structure. And we can tell very easily by virtue of the fact that they're not within 10 of each other. Okay? Each turn of the helix is about four amino acids. So you start counting, and you can pretty quickly decide that those two helices are more than 10 amino acids apart. Okay? This is at the root of tertiary structure. And we will see in a little bit that there are many forces that can stabilize tertiary structure. For secondary structure, the primary forces stabilizing secondary structure are hydrogen bonds. But there's many kinds of bonds that can stabilize tertiary structure. OK. All right. Now, this was a figure that you saw in the um, um, recitation. And it was one that I showed because I wanted students to say, well, what do you see in this figure, OK? And many of you said, justifiably, well, it's got color. What the heck do the colors refer to, right? Because I, there's no key here. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a deficiency in that figure. And by the way, one of the reasons I ask you to interpret figures is to get you to think about them. And second, I'm writing a new book on biochemistry, and we're doing new figures. And I'm creating the figures. I'm not using somebody else's figures for stuff. And so being able to create the figures using your input to make better figures than what existing books have, very, very valuable. So your input is very much appreciated when you s describe what you like and what you don't like about figures that are in an existing textbook. Okay. This, was, um, this uh, particular figure actually shows um, the uh, overall three-dimensional structure. And I said, I said of the one you saw before, this is like one you saw before. It's not the one you saw before. But this one is actually the three-dimensional structure of heme. And heme, you can see the heme group right here is in the middle. And we see a distribution of amino acids that are blue and are yellow. All right. One of the things that we discover about the three-dimensional structure of a protein is that most proteins fold so that the nonpolar amino acids are on the inside. And that's because most proteins are dissolved in the, in the water of the cytoplasm. That allows the hydrophobic amino acids, which are in yellow here, it allows the hydrophobic side chains to interact with each other. And it allows the hydrophilic, which are the blues, to interact with the water, which is on the outside. So one of the forces that drives the folding 
is the desire of the hydrophobics to interact with each other. And that's exactly what was happening when I showed you the oil droplets earlier. Remember that oil droplets wanted to associate with each other, and when they associated with each other, they went from being little tiny oil droplets to bigger and bigger oil droplets because the hydrophobics are associating with each other. Those same forces are driving the folding of a protein. Now, not all proteins okay, have this arrangement. You saw one example in the recitation. That's what I was referring to. The one you saw in the recitation was a protein that was sort of inside out. It had its hydrophobics on the outside and its hydrophilics on the inside. Where would we have, where might we have such a situation? Okay, so aquaporin is a, is a protein that has that. Why would it have such an arrangement? It's in a nonpolar environment, that nonpolar environment being the lipid bilayer. So proteins that are found in membranes frequently will have that property where their nonpolars will be on the outside because on the outside of where they're at, there isn't water. There's nonpolar side chains. It makes very good sense. In the case of porin, or aquaporin, same, same terminology, in the case of porin, porins let water go through them. They're basically holes in the side of a cell to let water pass through. Well, on the inside, that's where the water is. That's why you see in a porin the hydrophilics being on the inside. Okay? So what we're learning about protein structure is protein structure is like everything else in the universe. It obeys the laws of chemistry. There's nothing magical. There's nothing unusual about proteins relative to the rest of the universe. And that's a very important thing to remember. I will talk later in the term about some properties of enzymes, and I will describe them as almost magical. Okay? They are almost magical in some of the things that they do. But almost magical doesn't make them magical. Okay? Chemistry rules what happens with these molecules. Okay. Uh, there's porn. All right. Now, um, a very important consideration in the structure of proteins at a three-dimensional level, we're talking about tertiary structure, is that there are other forces besides hydrogen bonds that stabilize them. So one I've already described to you, that's hydrophobic bonds, those interactions between the amino acids that have hydrophobic side chains, hydrophobic interactions stabilize tertiary structure. Okay? There's another thing that will stabilize tertiary structure, and it's a very important player. We'll see this later in the lecture as well. And they're disulfide bonds. If you take two cysteine amino acid side chains, by the way, cysteine, if you don't remember, has a side chain that has a sulfhydryl, an SH. And when I showed you that in class, I said that SH side chain is very reactive. You put two sulfhydryls right very close to each other, and they will oxidize, making a bond between the two sulfurs called a disulfide bond. And that disulfide bond between those two sulfurs is covalent. And covalent bonds, you remember, are much stronger than hydrogen bonds. They're much stronger than hydrophobic bonds. And we could imagine that they would give great stability to the tertiary structure wherever they exist. And they do. They give great stability to tertiary structure wherever they exist. Most proteins that are globular have disulfide bonds. Most proteins that are globular have disulfide bonds. Okay. So you can see in the case here of uh, a, uh, an enzyme called ribonuclease that it has in its native, when we say native, we mean normal, folded, active form. Native means normal, folded, active. Okay. In its native form, it has one, two, three, four disulfide bonds. And we know 
that they're tertiary in nature because we've numbered the amino acids. And we can see that with the exception of this one right here, they are all more than 10 amino acids apart. So we're having interactions between amino acids that are far apart in primary sequence, but they're giving rise to the stability of this enzyme. This enzyme turns out to be very stable. We'll talk about that later in the lecture. We can break disulfide bonds using a chemical. There are a couple of chemicals that we can use to break disulfide bonds. The most common one we talk about is mercaptoethanol. What mercaptoethanol will do is it will convert disulfide bonds back into sulfhydryl bonds, or I'm sorry, sulfhydryl structures. We see here was a disulfide bond between these two, and now we see here is a sulfhydryl, and there was where it was over here, right? So we see that we no longer have a covalent bond after we've treated these disulfide bonds with mercaptoethanol. Okay. Well, if we break the structural supports for the protein and we break the hydrogen bonds of the protein, we can probably unfold the protein. And that's what's happening here. Urea, at high concentrations, destroys hydrogen bonds. Urea at high concentrations destroys hydrogen bonds. So this protein, because it has no hydrogen bonds stabilizing it, it has no disulfide bonds stabilizing it, readily unfolds and comes apart. We call that denatured. When we unfold and basically stop a protein from being functional, we call that process denaturation. So we've denatured this protein using these chemicals. We could also use heat because remember that heat will also denature or break the hydrogen bonds. Okay. That's in a nutshell what I want to tell you about tertiary structure. Okay? In a nutshell, that's tertiary structure. There's one, uh, actually, there's, actually back before I conclude, there's, there's two other forces I want to make you aware of that will help to stabilize uh, tertiary structure. I don't have a figure for it. All right? One of these is ionic. That's pretty easy to understand. Imagine instead of a sulfur-sulfur bond right there, imagine I had a COO minus where number 26 is, and I had an NH3 plus where 84 is. The plus attracted to the minuses, no surprise. Ionic bonds will be attractive. They're not going to make a covalent bond, but they will be attracting each other. And because they're attracting each other, they will also give rise to stability. So ionic bonds are also forces that will stabilize tertiary structure. Ionic bonds. Okay. Ionic bonds could be repulsive in nature. We could have a, a, a minus and a minus, and that would kind of keep things apart. And that also might help to give rise to the structure, overall structure of a protein. So it doesn't even have to always be attractive in nature. The last force that I will describe that stabilizes tertiary structure are those of metallic bonds. Many proteins have metals in them. And metallic bonds can also stabilize tertiary structure. <clears throat> so we see tertiary structure has a lot of things that can hold it together. We might think that tertiary structure is the stablest of the forms. It's not. You might wonder why that is. Why is tertiary not the stablest? Okay. Well, for tertiary structure to be, for tertiary structure, we have to have everything folded properly. If we unfold any part of that tertiary structure, we may lose the function of a protein. So tertiary structure turns out to be a fairly unstable structure. And that's why when people are isolating enzymes or isolating proteins from cells, they find that frequently, as they're isolating them, the proteins will denature and they will lose their function. And that's because that tertiary structure is getting lost during the isolation process. We'll see a little bit more about that in just a little bit. OK, questions about that? Yeah, up there. Uh, 
Okay, talking about the alpha keratin, were there disulfide bonds there as well? Those were disulfide bonds as well. So we talked about the curling, for example. Those are disulfide bonds that are happening relatively close to each other. Okay? Back here. Any effect of acids and bases on disulfide bonds? Not acids and bases as such, but things that have properties of oxidizing or reducing will, in fact, affect disulfide bonds. So there are some acids, for example, that will oxidize disulfide bonds. And this battery is going bad. Did you hear me okay there? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so now we'll turn our attention to quaternary structure. And quaternary structure is the easiest of all the structures to understand. As I mentioned earlier, it refers to interactions between separate protein subunits. Most, I should say most, but many, many proteins have more than one polypeptide chain in them. Each polypeptide chain has two ends. So if I have multiple polypeptide chains, let's say I had a dimer, meaning I had two subunits, I'd have something over here that has a beginning and an end. I'd have something over here that has a beginning and an end. They might be the same sequence. That is, this, this sequence is identical to this sequence. Or they might be different. This one's slightly different than this one. When these guys interact with each other, they're making quaternary structure. Okay? So quaternary structure relates to how those separate subunits interact with each other. We will see when I talk about hemoglobin next week that hemoglobin, the protein of our blood, contains two units called alpha that are identical to each other and two units called beta that are identical to each other. And so it forms a complex of these four subunits together. That is quaternary structure. Okay? You can see it actually right here. The red shows two units. I think these are the alphas. The yellow shows two identical other subunits, the betas. And you can see how they're arranged right here in this figure. There are interactions between the individual subunits. And if I were to say, based on what I've told you, I might say, what do you suppose are forces that would stabilize quaternary structure? What do you suppose are the forces that will stabilize quaternary structure? I heard hydrogen bonds. Every bond that stabilizes tertiary will also stabilize quaternary, because it doesn't matter if they're on separate chains or not. right? They can still interact and give rise to stability. So every force that stabilizes tertiary structure will also stabilize quaternary structure. Question there, yeah. Actually, it's a very good question. It turns out that in I, I, the, the proteins we talked about early in the class are mostly alpha subunits, which are the, the myoglobin and hemoglobin. They mostly contain alpha subunits. And these are sort of outliers. That is, the more commonly, uh, um, more common globular proteins will have a mixture of alpha and beta, but you're seeing exactly right. These are mostly alpha, alpha helices. Good, good, good eyes. OK. Other questions? You guys don't seem very energetic today. Is it Wednesday? Is that what it is? I didn't do the limerick of the day, did I? Let's do the limerick of the day. The limerick of the day today. The pilot of copters opines. It happens to him all the time. If he saves someone's rear, he will oft overhear that he uses such great pickup lines. <laughs> Bad joke. OK. Speaking of jokes, you guys like jokes? You want a joke? I'm going to tell a joke that I tell in all my old videos. So if you've watched my old videos, you're probably going to hear this. You've probably heard this joke before. But this is my favorite joke in the world, OK? This, is, this has my stamp of approval. It's my favorite joke. It's about Artie the Hitman. Anybody ever heard my joke about Artie the Hitman? <laughs> Is your name Artie by any chance? No. All right. Artie the Hitman, OK? So there's this guy, and he's, he's, he's decided that his, for his career, he wants to go and kill people for a living, right? And so he's going to be a hitman. So he's going to go out, and he's going to do this. And he says, 
You know, if you look at how the world operates, the way to get noticed and do something is to give something away for cheap or free. Because that's how the internet works, that's how things work, and so we get a lot of interest with this. So he, he's a pretty smart guy. So he makes out these little note cards and he says, we'll kill someone for cheap. And he puts his phone number down on this, right? And he goes around the neighborhood and he posts these things everywhere around the neighborhood, you know? And he goes home and he waits for the calls to come in. And sure enough, he's sitting there a little bit and he gets his phone call and says, is this Artie? He goes, yes it is. He says, and you kill people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, for cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, I want to kill my wife. He says, how much would you charge me to kill my wife? And Ari says, well, you know, I'm just getting started. I want to establish a name for myself, so I'll do it for a buck. He says, wow, that's great. And Ari says, how do, you, how do you want me to kill her? And he said, well, you know, he says, um, why don't you strangle her? Everybody's getting the kind of nervous laughter at this point, right? <laughs> Is he really going to do it? All right. He says, yeah. So, Artie, so the guy says, yeah, and Artie says, yeah, I'll do that. And he says, where's your wife at right now? He says, well, he says, as a matter of fact, she's down at the grocery store. You can find her down there. And he describes her to, to Artie and so forth. And Artie says, no problem. So he goes racing down to the grocery store, and he looks around for this description of this woman, and there she is, all by herself. Perfect. So he goes up, he grabs her, he strangles her right there in the grocery store. And she dies right there. It's awful, right? But he's figuring, hey, I, I'm, I did it. And he looks around, and somebody saw him. Oh, crap, right? Well, you can't leave a witness. You're not going to get around you know, to, get to do this for very long. So he has to go over, and he grabs the witness, and he strangles the witness right there so that there's no witnesses to the thing. Feeling better, and there's another one over here, right? So he goes over here, grabs this witness, and he strangles them right there in the grocery store. And he figures, I'm getting out of here. So he goes running out of here. And the police catch up with him. And the headlines in the paper the next day say, Artie chokes three for a dollar at the grocery store. <laughs> that is my favorite joke in the world. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Everybody's laughing at this, right? OK, that loosened things up a bit. Artie chokes three for a dollar at the grocery store. No, yeah, here you are. Good, that's a good change, right? No, I'm not going to tell another. I'll probably be in enough trouble over that one, but OK. All right, well, let's get back to talking about protein structure, because I know you guys want to learn a lot more about that. All right. Quaternary structure is essential also for actions of proteins. If we disrupt or destroy the quaternary structure of hemoglobin, hemoglobin is not going to function right. We'll see that when we talk about hemoglobin later. All right? So the quaternary structure of a protein is essential for its proper function. Okay? Quaternary structure can give rise to some pretty amazing things. What you see on the screen is the structure of a virus and viruses, you may note, have on their surface a coating of protein that protects on the inside a nucleic acid. And you can see, you can imagine that there is a lot, or there are a lot of interactions between the subunits that help to stabilize this particle, and, they, and there are. But what's remarkable about many viruses is they will self-assemble. Those pieces of the puzzle literally put themselves together to make that structure. When we think about nanotechnology and people working and making nanomachines and working on the molecular scale, nature solved it a long time ago. Pretty cool stuff. And it's arising and being stabilized as a result of quaternary interactions that are happening between individual proteins, some of them green, some of them blue, some of them red. Pretty cool. All right, well, those are the points I want to make about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Now I want to take some of that knowledge and begin to apply it. That will relate to what I'm going to talk about here and what I'll be talking about on Friday. Okay? The first of these is this enzyme that you saw earlier. 
bovine ribonuclease. It was the first enzyme whose overall structure and sequence was determined. Okay? You see that there are disulfide bonds that are holding together individual cysteines in this protein. Ribonuclease, and that's whether it's bovine or human or whatever, ribonuclease is an interesting enzyme, and it's an unusual enzyme. Most enzymes, if you take and you heat them up, they will denature, and they will not come back together. They will lose activity simply by heating them, even if they have disulfide bonds. But ribonuclease is an unusual one. Ribonuclease, we can take, we can heat it, we can break those hydrogen bonds, and what we discover is that if we cool it back down, it goes back to being active again. Okay? Most enzymes don't do that. Now, what that tells us, most likely, is that these disulfide bonds help to stabilize important parts of the protein so that when we remove the secondary structure, that it can reform easily and in the right orientation, allowing the enzyme to become active again. Disulfide bonds in most proteins don't allow that sort of self-assembly to happen, and that's why most proteins, when we heat them up or boil them, they lose their activity and they don't gain it back. Ribonuclease is very interesting in this respect. Okay. Yes, question. Oh boy, she's got a good question here. What keeps the C's in the right orientation? Why green with green, red with red, blue with blue, yellow with yellow? How does the cell know to do that? Okay. So she's thinking ahead. This is very good. All right. So let me get, let me try to answer that question for you. When I boil a protein, I don't break disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds stay together. So if I boil it, I still have the disulfide bonds, and those structural things are there to sort of allow this, the, the protein to sort of rebuild its walls. Most proteins don't have them in the right places, so the walls don't form properly. And the enzyme of the most proteins gets inactivated when we boil it. This one has them in just the right places, so these walls can reform. Now, ribonuclease has some very cool things. So I'm going to st step you through this. I showed you that mercaptoethanol will convert a disulfide bond into two sulfhydryl bonds. Okay? This is a reduction, the electrons coming from the mercaptoethanol, and when they give up the electrons, they themselves form a disulfide bond. So in essence, we are moving electrons from here to here. The loss of electrons results in the formation of a disulfide bond between the two mercaptoethanols. That's what's happening when we treat disulfide bonds for captoethanol. Okay? Now, if I take ribonuclease and I do what I described before, which is I take urea and I take mercaptoethanol, I can denature ribonuclease, right? Because the disulfide bonds are broken, the hydrogen bonds are broken, and those structural things that hold it together during boiling no longer are there. The same thing would happen if I boiled it at this point because there wouldn't be any disulfide bonds holding it together. These cysteines would be floating out there. They wouldn't be connected to each other. There would be no hydrogen bonds. And so let's imagine that I've done this and I've used either heat or urea to break the hydrogen bonds. Then all I have to do is either cool it or remove the urea and then ask what happens to that protein. Well, your prediction would be if we've broken the disulfide bonds that we would see that the protein would most likely not be active because it doesn't have those structural things allowing the walls to be rebuilt. Her question here was how does the protein know which ones to make? Well, it turns out that if you do this experiment that I just described to you, what you will see happen okay, is that when it comes back together, it will make something like what you see on the top. There won't be the right order to it. There will be a randomness based on how they interact in boing, 
They get stuck. And they enter and boing, they get stuck. Okay? So in general, what I will see if I do that experiment is I will see something like what I have at the top, and something what I have at the top will not be active. It will not be an active enzyme. Okay? Everybody with me so far? We've broken the disulfide bonds. We've broken the hydrogen bonds. We allow the disulfide bonds to reform. And when they reform, they will reform somewhat randomly. Okay? But then something surprising happens. The surprising thing that happens is if I leave a little bit, a little tiny bit of mercaptoethanol in the mixture while I am taking away the heat and taking away the urea, some of the protein will come back in the proper configuration. A little bit of mercaptoethanol allows that to happen. Why does that allow that to happen? Why does that allow that to happen? The reason is that if this forms randomly, a little bit of mercaptoethanol allows these bonds to loosen and allows the right structures to find each other. Why didn't they find each other up here? They did. If I did this experiment I described to you, I lied. Most of the protein will look like this, but a small percentage will come back together perfectly. A small percentage will come back together perfectly. And if I add a little bit of mercaptoethanol, it breaks these bonds and allows the rest of them to come back together perfectly. What does that tell you about what it takes to get the proper disulfide bonds together? What does it take? What is essential for that to happen? Nobody wants to guess on that one. That's an extra credit question. Proper alignment? No. Although that has to happen, but that's not what makes it happen. Flexibility? Yeah, but that's not what makes it happen either. A starting bond uh, that sort of catalyzes things forward. Not quite. Proper chemical environment. These are all important, but they're not the driving forces. Yeah. A reducing agent. Well, that was needed to help break that bond. But remember, we also had some of them that came back together without that reducing agent. Yeah. Stability of the structure? Nope. Decrease in entropy. Um, I'm not going to touch that one at the moment, but that's not the answer, no. Steric hindrance? Nope. It's simpler. You guys are making this a really hard problem. There's something right in front of your face that's telling you the answer, and you haven't hit it. Back in the back. Proper sequence of what? Proper sequence of amino acids. The only thing that's common there is the sequence of amino acids. What this tells you, and that's an extra credit question, so check with me later, OK? What this tells you is that the only information necessary to make that proper fold was contained in the sequence of the amino acids. When, this, when the protein was being made, number one, amino acid number one went into the protein, followed by amino acid number two, followed by amino acid number three, number four, number five. It went in sequentially. And as it was being built, those interactions, those hydrogen bonds, those folds all started to form as it was being built. For most proteins, the only way in which those folds will properly form is if things are sequentially made. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 105, 120, et cetera. All right? We have to make those sequentially in order for those interactions to form properly. And so when we take a normal protein and we denature it, if they weren't formed in the right order, that is, the, the protein is already there made, it can't come back together because it doesn't have a chance to go back in the order that it was made. It's already been made. Ribonuclease is unusual. It doesn't have to form its structures as a result of the, the order in which the amino acids get put together. All that matters is that the, all of the amino acids are there in the right order. So it doesn't matter how I put them together. As long as I have them together in the right order, this guy is going to form the right structure. It's really cool. It's really rare, but it tells us that sequence ultimately is all that we need 
to make structure. Sequence of amino acids is all that we need to make structure. And that's why two proteins that have different sequence have different structure. That's cool. Questions about that? No? Was that that clear? Was that that confusing? Or has the joke worn off and you're that asleep? Yes? Okay, so a very good question. It's a very common question. Her question is, if the sequence is there, it's already made, what do you mean by saying that it has to go together in the right order? If it's there, why doesn't it fold properly? Okay? And it doesn't because these sorts of interactions that you see here can start to cause it to fold the wrong way. And ribonuclease will, to some extent, show that, but if you give it the chance to form in the right way, it will. Most proteins will only assume their proper configuration if there's no confusion of sequences at the other end. When 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are made, there is no 120, 121, 122 to get in the way of the proper folding. But if I take that entire protein, 1 through 10, can interact over here with 120 through 130, and that may not give rise to a properly structured protein. Yes? How do subunits come together? They come together very much like what this does, but they ha that happens after they've folded. So if I have a subunit over here and another subunit over here, they will already have properly folded before now, and they're going to have on their surfaces things that will interact with things like that. So it turns out that the proper interactions for multi-subunits tends out to be simpler than what we have here. Because they're already folded, they're already in the right configuration to interact with each other. Yes? The last part, I didn't hear what you said. OK. So his, his question, comment was that, that you do make it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's very sequential, yes. And that during that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 sequential nature, that folding <laughs> starts to happen. And that's correct, too. And then after things are properly folded, I think what you're talking about was quaternary structure, they can interact with each other. And that's, that's exactly right, yeah. OK? Yeah, up there. Yeah, very good question. Why does the mercaptoethanol allow that to happen? Well, it turns out that what you see here, why does this even form at all? Okay, Why does this even form at all? Why doesn't it just go, everything go properly folded? I think is part of the, 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 um, is the corollary to your, your, your question. Okay? Folding has a randomness, a certain level of randomness associated with it. We don't fully understand folding. What you're seeing here is trapped randomness. Okay? Now, a driving force that overcomes that randomness is the sequence of amino acids. And in the case of ribonuclease, that driving force is strong enough that it can put together some things in the proper way. That driving force is not strong enough in most proteins. So when you see this, it's a result of visualization. Oh, there we go. Visualization of that randomness because we've, we've stopped this thing at a moment in time. But when we add the, the mercaptoethanol to it, that force that is causing the protein to fold here has a second chance to overcome that randomness. Does that make sense? Is this, I think the question is, is this energetically favorable for it to fold properly? Is that, what, is that the question? OK, so his question is, is it energetically favorable for it to fold properly? And the answer is absolutely. But what we find about folding, and folding is extraordinarily complicated. I'm making it very simple here, is that there are many energetically favorable folds that can make that don't give rise to stable proteins. And we'll, we'll see some examples of that, actually, uh, in a little bit. Back here.
Oh, there's a really good question also. Okay? How does the thing know to glom onto itself and not onto something else? And the answer is, it will glom onto other things. Again, this is a random thing. So what I'm showing you only interactions within itself. We can imagine in a random solution where those, those cysteines are out there, they could boing into each other and make now a covalently bonded dimer, and that, that happens. So again, the addition of the mercaptoethanol allows them to come apart and fold on their own. Yep, okay. This really isn't a, a good example for Ramachandran plots, no. Ramachandran plots define uh, steric limits, basically. And th those steric limits do play into this. This has more to do with supramolecular structure. So it's, yeah. Ramachandran plots are focused on fairly close interactions. Yeah. One more question. If you gave this enough time, it would pretty much go to 100%. Yep. Yep. I hear rustling. That means it must be song time. <laughs> the mellow woes. This is about, this is a student experience. It's to the tune of the Yellow Rose of Texas. The term is almost at an end, 10 weeks since it began. I worried how my grade was, because I did not have a plan. I can't hear you. The first exam went not so well. I got a 63. It was just about the average score in biochemistry. I buckled down the second time, did not sow my wild oats. I downloaded the videos and took a ton of notes. I learned about free energy and delta G naught prime. My score increased by seven points, a C plus grade was mine. I sang the songs I memorized, I played the MP3s. I learned the citrate cycle and I counted ATPs. I had electron transport down in all of complex V. I guessed when I saw my exam, it was a 93. So heading to the final stretch, I crammed my memory and came to class on sunny days for quizzing comedy. I packed a card with info and my brain almost burned out. It was much to my delight, I got the A I dreamed about. So here's the moral of the song, it doesn't pay to stew. Its scores are not quite what you want and you don't have a clue. The answers get into your head when you know what to do. Watch videos, read highlights, and review, review, review.